So how many of you have kids? Right, now, do you remember what they sounded like when they were infants? It's hard, isn't it? You have pictures. You probably even know what their first words were, but what did they sound like when they were children? I, have, I happen to have a little bank of uh, voices from my, my son, and so I'm going to play you a sample of him. So I just want to close your eyes. Just do me the honor of just closing your eyes and listening to this voice as it evolves over from nine or eight to nine months on to 15. So, I mean, that's just a small snippet, but even that babble had a unique kind of sound to it. And as he grew older, there was differences in the way he used his voice. In fact, it gets a little raspier because he had a little bit of reflux. But what is the story in our voices? How do our voices capture who we are, what we do, our personalities? There's so much flexibility in our voice. It captures our cultural heritage, maybe even the places we've been, the places that we aspire to go, because when we say those words or those places' names, we get excited, and there is something in listening to ourselves as well as into others. So, in the words of the poet Longfellow, the human voice is the organ of the soul. Now, how do we capture that particular aspect of the voice, which is so much more than the physical organs that give rise to it? How do we capture that in a prosthetic voice? So, not long ago, I met a mountain climber who told me that if he could trade his prosthetic legs for the original organic legs he was born with, he wouldn't do it. But I've yet to meet someone who says the same thing about their prosthetic voice, a technology that turns text into robotic, mechanical-sounding speech. That's because, in the case of prosthetic limbs, technology's evolved to a point where people can climb mountains and even compete in the Olympics. But in the case of the prosthetic voice, Technology is still a barrier, and I know we can change that. I want to tell you a little bit more about that. I'm going to have you listen to this voice, which you may recognize. I would have thought it was fairly obvious what I meant. So that voice, who do you think that voice? Would... Yeah, so we've begun to think that that voice belongs to Stephen Hawking, but that voice is used by hundreds and thousands of other individuals who rely on prosthetic voices, maybe even women and men. And I was at a conference several years ago, actually almost a decade ago now, where I saw a little girl and a grown man having a conversation using that voice. Okay? And I looked around, and in that exhibit hall were hundreds of other people using the same voice. And just earlier that morning, I'd given a talk on my research where we've been showing that um, my colleagues and I that people who have speech disorder can still control certain aspects of their voice, the melody, the prosody of their voice, changes in pitch, changes in loudness. Those are preserved. Those also happen to be the same cues that are important for speaker identity. So that's when I put two and two together and thought, can we build a voice that is like this individual, even if they have speech impairment, how can we build a voice for them that's unique to them? Because this prosthetic box that they have to talk, this functional talking box, isn't just about the words they're saying. It should communicate who they are and how they grow from being a young person to an adult who has a voice. It's not just the words that we say, but it's how we express them. So let me take you on a journey of how we did that. Here's a young woman who we built a voice for, and she's no different than other individuals who use assistive devices to communicate. My name is Samantha. I don't use my voice to talk, but I use my iPhone. So what, what do you think of the voice that you're using? It sounds weird. And it doesn't have to be that way. So here are two voices of two individuals who are saying the same thing. <laughs> While you may not have understood what they said, I hope that you heard their unique vocal identities. 
So we set out to capture how we can build these kinds of voices. Before we get there, I need to tell you a little bit about speech production and how it works. So first, speech is a combination of the sounds produced by your voice box, the vocal folds. As they vibrate, they produce sound, but that sound is just like a hum. That needs to move through the rest of the vocal tract, the chambers of your head and your neck that now allow you to produce sounds like vowels and consonants. The combination of the source and the filter, what we call the head and the neck, allows us to hear speech. Okay? Now, what has been preserved, as I told you in the story earlier, in people who cannot speak, is their source is relatively intact, but their filter is impaired. So what we did, is good science would say, is why don't we dissociate these two? Why don't we take the filter from someone who's a donor, a surrogate donor, and let's take the recipient's vocal source and blend those two together. So now we can create a voice that's as unique as the individual who needs to use it, but is as clear and understandable as their donor. That's exactly what we're doing. We're creating custom crafted voices that combine speech from a healthy donor and vocal samples, just a little bit, from those in need. That's because we've discovered that just even a single vowel contains enough vocal DNA to seed that personalization process. Okay, so now, how do you build a voice? How do you build a synthetic voice? Well, it's not as ominous as it seems. You actually have to get someone to donate a lot of speech. Most donations require us to lose something to gain, right? In this case, speech recordings are a whole new type of biological donation. They're recorded using everyday technology like your phone. They're encrypted to protect confidentiality. They're stored in the cloud. They're typed for a match, and they're blended. So here's how we create a voice. We first have a donor produce a number of sentences. We need about three to four hours of speech to get a decent sounding voice. Now, we know that Siri is made from hundreds of thousands of hours, probably, of speech. These voices are going to be different because no real person, an everyday donor, is going to give, well, Siri's a real person too, but there, no uh, everyday citizen is going to give that much speech. So here's how the process goes. Things happen in pairs. I love to sleep. The sky is blue without clouds. So she goes on like this for several hours. Now, once we have all those recordings, what we have to do is cut those recordings up into little snippets of speech. And that allows us then to recombine those little snippets into utterances that were not previously recorded. Okay? This is concatenative synthesis. There's nothing new about this. Technology's been around for many years. You find the snippets of speech that you're looking for, fish through that database, and then say this sentence. I love chocolate. Everyone needs to be able to say something like that, right? Um, um, but the thing is, that's not unique. What's unique, though, is when we then build a voice for the individual that is going to use the voice. So here's Samantha, the woman you saw earlier. We had been building a voice for her for many years using samples of her voice when she was nine. She'd, she'd come in for a separate experiment. We, we teamed up with her a little bit later, last year sometime, when she was 17, and we wanted to create a voice for her today because the nine-year-old voice no longer sounds like Samantha today. So Samantha produced some vowels for us, and what we were able to do then is have a donor produce some those utterances for us and create a voice for her. When I was explaining this process to my daughter, who was then six, she said, Mommy, you're mixing colors to paint voices? I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Now she calls it flavoring the voice because she's into cooking. But, but here's how it goes. Samantha will produce a vowel, and that will color the entire database. Uh... So she can say something like this. This voice is only for me. I can't wait to use my new voice with my friends. That's her 17-year-old voice that she's using now. The voice she was using before. <laughs> the 
the voice she was using before sounded like a grown woman. It didn't have any flavor of who she was. So Samantha was one person. We've had a few beta users, and this project really has taken on a life of its own. As Saul was talking about, initially it was a research project. It was um, work where we were sort of uncoupling what people can do with their voice and um, where we can actually build these personalized voices. But now we've decided to create what we call the Human Voice Bank. It's an initiative to get lots of other people, everyone from 6 to 99, to donate their voice. Um, the challenge is collecting voices that will be good enough to be able to use in speech synthesis. It's a natural experiment. We don't know. Can we, in fact, collect enough voices that we can start blending voices that are unique? Just one voice can generate hundreds of voices for those in need. And what we're doing is we've created a number of different apps. And so I'll show you sort of an idea, a feel of what it means to donate your voice. So this interface basically provides you a virtual studio that you could access from your home, and maybe even from studio partnerships that we are connecting right now. Um, partnerships that will allow us to connect, collect high fidelity voices. So you see an utterance, you say the utterance, and as you say the utterance, what happens is that back wall which we call the periodic table of speech. That back wall will start to light up as you bank more and more of your speech. So I'll say, how are you? Great. Good to see you. And we actually don't want a lot of expression and so on, because if you have a lot of expression in the recorded samples, it creates a lot of distortion when we start concatenating the speech. But this process goes on, and if we could build gamification into this, and this is a call to see if anyone wants to get involved in this project, how can we build in more and more gamification so that people will continue to do this and give us voices that we can use to blend with others? So this is the web portal, and um, as, as I said, as you continue to build on, the light, it will light up that, project, that wall in the back. We also teamed up with an um, iPhone developer and an Android developer, Bottle Rocket Apps, to develop a web, uh, uh, sorry, an iPhone and an Android app. Um, and these apps are also going to be available. And it will be really interesting to see the kinds of voices we can create. And now, unlike the experiments that we were doing in the laboratory, where you know, we really could only create voices that were of the same, from the same individual that was about the same age and gender, we can now think about a much broader picture. So we've got about 20,000 pl 20, plus donors already, and we are so excited about this. Uh, each dot on that map represents about 50 individuals who have signed up to donate. We're now only now going to be launching the web collection app and the iPhone app. And uh, really, I think what this is, is beyond this project, it's how to capture a time capsule of our voice today. What is humanity's voice? How does it vary from culture to culture? And what is the experience that's different between one individual living in Rhode Island and another living across the world in Kazakhstan who's also going to be producing these utterances? This is a real opportunity for us to see the commonalities in us rather than the differences we see. Um, so I'm super excited about this, and I hope that over time we will build this resource. I want to come back and circle back to the real motivation for this work, and that's um, people like Samantha, and maybe even you and I one day, who may want our own vocal persona, persona that capture our own unique personalities that we can endow onto our digital devices. So this moment that you're going to see is when Samantha first heard her voice that we had created for her. And sometimes everything is in what you see. Sometimes it's what you hear. My name is Samantha, and this is my new voice. Wow. I think it sounds great. She was all smiles. And in fact, she wanted to get rid of every app that was on her iPhone. Uh, not app, but every picture of her cat that she had on her iPhone so that she could get the voice on her phone as well. So anyways, that is my story. And hopefully uh, that has in some way inspired you to think about your voice and where your voice and what uh, what, your vo what the voice you wear today, what it says, and how your voice has changed and evolved over time. Thank you.